Well, good morning. My name is Amanda Weber, and I am the lead pastor here at Oak Grove, and it is a great joy and blessing to be worshiping with you this morning. So this morning, we have two scripture readings. The first is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, and I will be following that with a reading from the book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, and both are from the New International Version. Let us hear the word of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter uh, to the church in Coloss, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had this great vision of me running out, probably the only time I'm in any sort of Olympic relay, but I forgot that I was going to be in heels and a dress today as I envisioned that. So this morning we are continuing the quadrilateral relay. We are handing off the baton from reason to tradition in our series, The Quad. But unlike a true relay race, we went a bit out of order discussing reason week last week because tradition is that tradition is typically the second bulwark of the Wesleyan quadrilateral. So for those of you who are visiting with us today for the first time, or maybe as part of celebrating our amazing and awesome high school senior graduates, this morning is the fourth week of our sermon series, The Quad. And this is a, a series that is designed to help us make good choices, choices that are in alignment with our faith and the work that God has uniquely created us for and then called us to do. We began the series on Pentecost Sunday when Pastor Brittany talked about the power of the Holy Spirit and the role that the Holy Spirit actually plays in guiding our discernment. We actually often think of those as Holy Spirit nudges. And then week two, we actually introduced this whole idea of the Wesleyan quadrilateral, a process that John Wesley engaged in to help him and others see God's particular method of working by looking at scripture in light of tradition, reason, and experience. Today, we move to week four, and we are focusing on how we can use tradition to help us make good choices. Now, I went a little out of order because graduation, graduation, whether from preschool or grad school, is steeped in tradition. 
And 2024 marks another meaningful tradition as well. Any ideas? The Olympics, yes, the 2024, the 33rd Summer Olympics. And both of these traditions are actually excellent examples of the power and the importance of tradition in our discernment process. So we're going to begin thinking about the power of tradition with a remarkable moment in Olympic history. I'm going to take you back to the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So I want you to take a moment and think about um, who was in leadership in 1936 in Germany. It was Adolf Hitler. And during the 1936 Olympics, African-American athlete Jesse Owens, who had broken three world records just the year before in 1935, continued to defy, yes, defy Adolf Hitler's notion of Aryan supremacy as Owens won an additional four um, gold medals during the 1936 Olympics. Owens actually went on to be considered one of the greatest Olympic athletes of all time and to this day is considered to have had more influence over the Olympics than any other athlete in history. But one of his most significant victories in the 1936 Olympics was in the 4 by 100 meter relay race. You see, it's interesting in a relay race, intuitively, uh, for us non-athlete types, they kind of go out of order, right? They have the fastest person, they are what they call the anchor leg. And so, the anchor leg, as the anchor leg of this relay team, Owens received the baton, from his teammate, Ralph Metcalf, and he sprinted towards the finish line. The interracial American team actually set a new world record on that day of 39.8 seconds, defeating Germany and Italy and showcasing the power, the power of unity and teamwork amidst a tense political climate. What is beautiful about this story is that this tradition, the Summer Olympics, an athletic tradition that was then and now accepted and celebrated around the world, continued to open the door of closed minds to new ways of understanding and, and thinking about racial equality, the power of teamwork, and celebrating individual talent. And like the Olympics, graduation is also this time when we celebrate both individual and collective accomplishments. We engage in time-honored traditions such as mortarboard caps and gowns, a tradition that dates back thousands of years, and a tassel turning, the presentation of diplomas, and honoring the top two students in the class with the titles of valedictorian and salutorian. And each of these students also has an invitation to address their graduating class and the guests. High school graduation in particular unifies us as a community by connecting our graduates with shared values. The value that we are all part of something greater than who we are individually. Along with the shared value that um, we are called to responsibly contribute in a positive way to society. 
I personally believe this is why high school graduation is celebrated by so many, not just by the high schools and the graduates and their families, but also by, by churches and many other community organizations. It's because of this, this shared value that we are part of a larger community, a community that contributes to our well-being and our success. All right. So by now you might be asking, what does all this actually have to do with decision making? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, the Olympics and graduation, it actually illustrates this power of tradition to bind us together and to influence the future for good. And they ultimately help us better understand perhaps why John Wesley thought it was important to include tradition right after scripture as part of his way of understanding and seeing God's particular method of working in our lives. I thought it would be fun to just do a real brief word study with you on the actual English word of uh, tradition, and our uh, Latin students will appreciate this, hopefully. Um, the word uh, tradition, in particular, um, is important to churches all throughout the world because churches are steeped in tradition. But it's also um, a powerful word for us as a country, the United States, because there are many trad traditions that we embrace as a country. So as a word, tradition originates from the Latin word uh, tradio, which is a noun that is derived from a Latin bird, tradir. Now, tradir is a combination of a prefix, the prefix trans, meaning to cross over, along with the verb dare, meaning to give. Hence, tradir literally means to give across or to hand over. So over time, the meaning of the word tradition for us has actually expanded to the passing on of various aspects of culture and expectations, including religious practices, social customs, and even schools of thoughts, especially in the fields of medicine, law, arts, and theology. But as individuals, tradition um, offers us valuable insight as well. Insight to cultural norms, norms within our family. So think Christmas traditions, right? I won't make you raise your hand, but how many times have we all done something that we really didn't want to do because it was a family tradition? And then we have tradition of, in the church. Think about the liturgical calendar. Think about the Lord's Prayer and confirmation. We had the joy of conf confirming one of our students this morning at 8.30. And then there's tradition in the wider culture. And with this, we can think about everything, everything from music to food to generational identity like, for example, the baby boomers and the 1960s. In other words, tradition forms us individually and collectively. It also gives us a sense of belonging to groups as small as our um, family unit and as large as universities and the church universal. So as an Anglican priest, John Wesley, the father of the Methodist tradition, developed a theology that was rooted in scripture. John Wesley, as I shared before, believed that scripture contains everything we need to know for our salvation. But he also believed that theological traditions help us interpret the meaning of scripture 
especially the writings of our church fathers. So in particular, John Wesley considered the tradition of the ancient church to be important, and he studied and integrated these practices and theological teachings into his theology and our shared theology today. Now, he considered the ancient church uh, to be the first 300 years of the church. Now, one of the things that was interesting about John Wesley, and maybe even something at this point in learning about him we would come to expect, is he appreciated uh, the writings of church fathers from both the Eastern church tradition and the Western church tradition. You see, the very first uh, big schism in the church was between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. The Eastern Church is what we know then and now as the Orthodox Church, and the Western Church then and now is what we know as the Catholic Church. And in my mind, part of what makes John Wesley's teaching and his theology so brilliant is his ability to be bent towards humility. John Wesley never believed that he had all of the answers, and he actually appreciated and sought out people who thought differently from him which is part of why he studied and appreciated the writers from all early church traditions. So as we move to kind of think about tradition in our discernment process um, and our application of the quadrilateral, we begin with scripture, and then we understand scripture through tradition. And while John Wesley argued that scripture contains everything we need to know for salvation, he also believed something else. Um, He believed that there were times when scripture had the potential to be imperfect because humanity is imperfect. Odin notes in his book on John Wesley's teachings that Wesley was quick to concede that the ancient Christian writers made many occasional mistakes, many weak suppositions, and many ill-drawn conclusions from drawing conclusions too quickly. Nonetheless, John Wesley wrote, I exceedingly reverence them as well as their writings because they describe true, genuine Christianity. So when we're using tradition as part of the quadrilateral, we think first about the traditions from the ancient church, the first 300 years of the church. And then we move to the traditions of the church over the millennia since then. In my reading of John Wesley's understanding of the significance of tradition, I have come to believe that this is a practice that was first and foremost grounded for him in scripture. And we can really see this in today's scripture readings, which is why I selected them. But they are just two of many, many texts in our Bible that indicate that we should be using tradition as part of our discernment process. So the first reading is the Shama. And it is an essential Jewish prayer that is grounded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. This is a prayer that has been faithfully recited twice daily for thousands of years by our Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, the book of Deuteronomy is the fifth and final book in the Torah. And this is important because it um, begins just outside the promised land with Moses teaching a new generation of Israelites. You see, Moses was teaching them about the Torah and trying to prepare them to enter the promised land. 
because the Exodus generation of Israelites, right, God told them that they would not be allowed to enter the promised land. So the Shammah reminds the Israelites of their belief in one true God as they prepare to enter the promised land, a land which was inhabited by the Canaanites who comprised a polytheistic society, right? So they were about to enter this land that they had been promised as people who believed in worshiping the one true God. But they were going to be surrounded by a society that believed in many gods. So the shamas served as this daily reminder of Israel's fundamental belief in one true God, along with the values that God had instilled in them the importance of loving God and loving their neighbor, but not only that, the importance of teaching the faith to future generations. So the Shema is also significant to our tradition, the Christian tradition. As Christians, we understand, and when we read the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was actually challenged by the Pharisees about what the greatest commandment was, Jesus actually was quoting this text, Deuteronomy chapter 6, emphasizing the significance of loving God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind. So then the second reading from today comes from uh, the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And this is a reading where we see the apostle Paul encouraging believers to live their lives rooted in and built up in Jesus, strengthened in the faith as they were taught and overflowing with gratitude and thankfulness. Similar to the Shama, Colossians 2 emphasizes the importance of both being grounded in the faith tradition that we have been taught and raised in, but then passing it down to the next generation of believers. Now, one of the things that is fascinating, if you picked up on it, in chapter 8, or verse 8 of today's reading from Colossians, is that it ended with this warning. It ended with a warning for us to not blindly follow human tradition, because when we do this, we risk being taken captive by empty promises of worldly teachings and philosophies. So right, this is similar to something we talked about last week with reason, that it is incumbent upon us to understand individually and collectively that we live in a time when it can be very hard to identify the truth and identify reality, making the ability to discern and identify God's will more crucial than ever before. And so I just encourage you to use the quadrilateral, and you can use it and apply it in your daily life and even in situations when you are trying to discern truth. And especially if you wrap this discernment process in prayer. So the Wesleyan quadrilateral is um, a way that we can faithfully discern not only challenging decisions, but also what is true in our lives. And Colossians is one of the scriptural groundings for this. So as we draw to a close and think about um, celebrating our 2024 graduates, these graduates who have overcome so many obstacles, you see, you may um, think back and remember that this was the class that entered high school in the fall of 2020. Anyone remember what was going on in the fall of 2020? Seems like it's a distant past, doesn't it? 
But the fall of 2020, there were, um, we were still largely shut down because it was before we had COVID vaccines. And so they started high school in this time that was a very difficult time in history. So graduates, we are handing you this baton in the relay of life. As you graduate from high school and move on from one phase to the next, grab a hold of that baton like Jesse Owens did. Hold on to all that it represents tight. And as you run into the future that God created you, you uniquely for, remember the traditions that have brought you to this point. Embrace these traditions and teach these traditions. May your faith always guide you. May you use the quadrilateral to make decisions. And may you always remember that you are not alone. God is with you. And you are and always will be one of God's beloved.